when God convicts you about something, if you don't do something about it in that moment or in that window of time, you'll actually end up getting offended at God and he'll take you further away because you didn't yield to him. But if you act on that conviction being cut to the heart and you say, God, forgive me, God, I want God, and then he will fill you to levels you never imagined. Well, today is Pentecost Sunday, and about 10 years ago, the Lord really spoke to my heart. He said, I want the church to celebrate Pentecost to the same level that it celebrates Christmas and Easter. Yes. So, yeah, that's, that's the goal. So, I don't know that the, the uh, other streams of the church are there, but uh, this is, that's where we're headed. <laughs> that's what we do. We celebrate Pentecost because uh, we believe that uh, Jesus commanded the Holy Spirit to wait to be empowered from on high, and so we go back and kind of uh, re look at look at His words, what He said, and get ready and uh, walk in it. Amen, amen. I don't know how many of you have been in a birthing room. All right, uh, yeah, birthing room. And so, as you're in a birthing room, maybe in a hospital, maybe in a home, and maybe in a birthing center, but um, if you've ever been in a birthing room, sometimes there's pain, there's joy, there's there's anticipation, there's fear, there's excitement, but uh, usually when the baby comes out, you know, you're like, wow, it's done. There's joy of receiving that child. You may not even know what gender it was before it was born. Our uh, youngest son was supposed to have a girl, and uh, I mean, I was, let me back up. <laughs> His wife was supposed to have a girl. Did the ultrasound and everything. When the child came out, it was a boy. <laughs> Great picture, man, when he first startled. So, but we love boys. Third grandson. But in a birthing room, there's a, just a, there's a lot of emotions that happens, that takes place. But what we're going to look at today is the birthing room of the church. That's really what Acts 2 is all about. Where the Holy Spirit came upon the church is really the birthing room of the church as we know it today, as we as we have become a part of that today, have been grafted in. We're going to look at the beginnings here this morning. So if you have your Bibles or devices, open up to uh, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And as we look at Acts chapter 2, I'm going to read the first four verses, and then we'll get into the remainder of the text as we journey down through this morning. But looking at uh, Acts chapter 2, we see several things that have uh, taken place here. First of all, kind of back up a little bit before, we, before I read that. Uh, backing up here a couple of messages. We learned in uh, John chapter 20 was where the disciples were born again. That was where Jesus rose from the dead that morning. He met them that evening. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So at that point, the Holy Spirit came to live within them. They were born again disciples at that moment. And then after that time, there was 40 days where Jesus began to open the scriptures to them and tell them about uh, what was going on and what was going to happen and what his plans were and what his purposes for, uh, were for the church. But one of the things he specifically said is to wait until you've been clothed with power from on high. He said that at the end of Luke and then coming out again in the first chapter of, uh, of uh, Acts. He said, wait until you've been clothed with power from on high, specific instructions, and so they did. Jesus went back to heaven after 40 days. There was a 10-day period of time that they joined together. They prayed. They waited. I'm not sure if they knew what they were waiting for, but they said, we'll just trust God, and we'll figure it out as we go along. They were waiting for this gift that Jesus said would be given to them by the Heavenly Father. So that's kind of the, the background and opening. Let me read four verses from Acts chapter 2, and then we'll jump in here this morning. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. What an amazing moment to birth the church. 
It was, uh, wow. I don't, again, uh, I don't know that the Holy Spirit ever showed up in that way again, but uh, there was a pattern that was set from that time on that everybody that would be born again should be filled with the Holy Spirit. That was a pattern that you'll see walked out throughout the whole New Testament in the book of Acts. That was what they were expected. So it wasn't just receiving the person of the Holy Spirit when you're born again. It's also receiving the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to do what Jesus started. That's really what it is. So I've entitled the message this morning, Empowered Witness. Because you can be a witness in this world, but not be an empowered one. Jesus is looking for empowered witnesses. And that's the distinction that I believe he wants to highlight here this morning. As, uh, as we, you journey down through this, uh, this chapter, what you'll notice is that when this took place, there was 120 in the upper room, and it says that they were gathered there from all around the region, perhaps all around the world, people coming to celebrate Pentecost. Now, what was Pentecost? It was really one of the big three festivals that the Jews celebrated. Passover, the, the, uh, the uh, festival of tabernacles where they went out in the woods and they repented for a week. And then Pentecost, which was the beginning of the harvest. Very fitting for what Jesus had in mind spiritually that there would be a harvest for the whole world. And we're still in that harvest that was started on Pentecost Day. And on that particular day, they came and they brought first fruits from the beginning of the harvest. They brought it into the temple and they celebrated that God was their father, their provider, and that he was going to give them the harvest that was due them, that was planted, but was yet to be brought in. They're only bringing the first of what started. That was the day of Pentecost, the celebration. Now, I counted up all the different ethnic groups that were present there that day. I came up with 16. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something real quick. Um, how many people here today know a language other than English? Raise your hand. Okay, you know a language. Uh, okay, what's your, what's your, what other language you know? French, French okay. Tongues. I, I knew somebody would say that. <laughs> what? Sign language, okay? Uh, French and two Congolese language, all right? Bob? Russian, Russian. okay? What else? German, German. all right? What, are, what do we got over here? Haitian Creole. 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 All right, Spanish. Wow, four there. Okay, did I get them all? I, I wasn't counting. I don't know if anybody was counting. But even, even here this morning, we have people that know different languages. Even though English is our primary language, we, we know, but other people know different languages. And again, they were in a setting where there was people coming together. Obviously, they had a common language to be able to come to the festival. But that probably wasn't the language that they spoke when they went home. Now, the phenomena that took place is that God didn't want to come in secret. He didn't want to just confine it to the 120. He wanted to display to the world, I'm back. I'm here. And so what he did was he enabled those 120 to speak in the languages of those that were gathered there that day. And they were like, wow, we've, we've never seen anything like this before. I'm sure they didn't uh, get out Rosetta Stone the 40 days and, and do Rosetta Stone and learn my language. What is going on here? They were astounded. They were surprised. They were shocked, it says there in the text. In fact, they even accused them of being drunk. So that was the association that they had. And yet... What they were saying was in their language, and they knew those people had not learned it. So this got their attention. God's coming. He's displaying himself to the world. And, and, and they're like, okay, you got my attention. What do you want to say? Now, let's just hold that for a moment. And I want to, I want to walk down through what is the value or the purpose of tongues in the New Testament. And there's really four different purposes that God gives. The first one is for evangelism which is illustrated here. They actually spoke in a language they hadn't learned, and as a result, the other people heard them in their language, and they knew that they hadn't learned it, and it, they, it, it caught their attention, and they're like, I want to know more. 
And that's happened today. I could tell you stories of people that speak in their prayer language, and it actually is another language that somebody else knows in the audience, and they'll say, wow, where did you learn that? Or God spoke to me through that. So that happens today. I can verify. So number one, the purpose of tongues for evangelism. Number two, the purpose of tongues is for intercession. This is found in Romans chapter 8, verse 26 or 7. If you go 26 through 28, you'll get it. But it says there that we don't know how to pray in our weakness. We're, we're, we're clueless of how to pray. But it says the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groans and words that we don't even have. So the whole, another purpose of tongues is for intercession. That we actually pray and the Holy Spirit intercedes through us to be able to figure out what God wants to do in that situation so that we have understanding in order to put it into practice. The third purpose that tongues is used for is personal edification. That you actually are edified. Uh, Dan and I were, were away at a, at a healing conference for three days. We were, we, the, the conference was in Falls Church. We, we went to the, con it, it was held from nine to five for three days. And we were sitting on metal chairs. <laughs> it was grueling. But the seminar was great. We're like, we're not going to do this. So after the morning session, we went to Target and we bought good cushions. <laughs> we brought it back and said, we're going to cushion this a little bit, even though it's painful and grueling. But the, the, I mean, the conference was great, you know, but a little bit grueling. We made it through. We're like, wow, the last hour was rough. But I came home and worked on my message. And honestly, I woke up this morning. I wasn't feeling it too well this morning, all right, just to be straight up with you. I come dragging in here, and I'm like, man, this has got to change. I'm worn out. So I started praying in my prayer language. About 10 minutes in, suddenly, this gust of, yeah, this is a new day. Let's do this came in. But I, it wasn't that way where I started. I said, something's got to change. Again, I began to edify myself through the language of the Spirit. I heard this recently, and I thought, wow. It says, if somebody prays in tongues 15 minutes a day, you will boost your immune system 25%. That's amazing, but I, yet I believe it. I believe it. It has benefits for us, not just spiritually, but our soul and our body as well. The fourth purpose of why tongues is used is for prophecy. In other words, we've had that happen here at Crossroads on occasion. Somebody wants to, feels like there's a prophecy for the group and said, I need to start in tongues, and then we'll wait for the interpretation as it's taken place in that way. So you look at all those four different purposes of what tongues were used for, for evangelism, for intercession, for our personal edification, and for prophecy, four different purposes and ways that tongues was used. Now let me ask the question, which one of those needs an interpretation? Only one. The first one is self-evident. You're speaking in tongues, the person knows the answer. There's no interpretation needed. The second one is for intercession. There's no interpretation needed because God is showing you what needs to be done. There's no need for intercession when you're just praying in your prayer language, praising God. That doesn't need, that often happens here in worship. You hear somebody praying or singing in tongues. That often doesn't need an interpretation because they are just edifying their self as they were. So the only one that needs is the fourth one, and that is prophecy. If someone has a prophecy for the group and it comes out in tongues, then it needs an interpretation. Again, sometimes it's helpful because I get questions from people saying, hey, there was tongues going on. Why was it that interpreted? Well, it wasn't supposed to because they were, again, praising in their language. So it's helpful for us to, to, to be able to, to grasp some of these things and, and understand it. All right. I think I'm ready for the outline. How about that? Maybe I've already jumped in. I may be half down through, but here we go. Number one, the empowering of the Holy Spirit. I read that. I'm probably halfway through point number one, headed to point number two. I did all of that. Let me catch up here for a moment. In Luke 24, 49, he writes, Jesus says, I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. That word is dunamis, from where we get dynamite. It means ability, abundance, miraculous strength. Catch this, dunamis. It means ability, abundance, and miraculous strength, the miraculous power. Jesus said in Acts 1-4, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. 
Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised you have heard me speak about. So we learn two things. One is a power, and second of all, it's a gift. It's a gift to us. And that, that is what Jesus, how Jesus described the Holy Spirit coming. So in verse 11, they were declaring the wonders of God. And then we find out in verse 39 of chapter 2 that it is the expected pattern that would follow. Born again, baptized in water, baptized in the Holy Spirit. It says in verse 39, let me just read it here real quickly. It says, this promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. That's us. We, we, we were far off. We were only a figment in God's imagination, but we were born. And for all whom the Lord our God will call. Is God still calling today? Okay. Then the promise is for us that we would participate in that. Number two, explanation of the Holy Spirit. We find the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now we find the explanation of the Holy Spirit that Peter gave and he starts out in verse 12 in giving an explanation. Let me read here. Was, uh, really, let's start in verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I have to say. He's getting ready now to explain what's going on. Obviously, he's got their attention through the languages that are being spoken. And then second of all, he's going to explain what is going on. He was directed to read out of the prophet Joel, Joel 2, about to explain the phenomena that is taking place. I don't know whether Jesus directed them to read out of Joel or whether Peter found that. I don't know, but he, he knew where to go. I mean, he had been born again. And now he's waiting for this gift. He's just been filled with the Holy Spirit. And suddenly he's taken to the prophet Joel. Again, whether he had that beforehand or got it in a moment, I don't know. But he got it. This is the explanation. He says in verse 12, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. That actually is taking place at that very moment. That promise is being fulfilled. Now let me continue and I will add that I believe this is yet to be fulfilled. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness. I guess if you have an eclipse, then that qualifies. The moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Certainly that's an action. So I would dare submit that part of this is fulfilled and part of it is yet to be fulfilled, which leads me back to the opening three words of that prophecy. It says, in the last days. What does that mean? In the last days is, is quoted here. It's also quoted in Hebrews chapter 1, where it says that in previous times the word was given through angels and the prophets, but in the last days, listen to my son Jesus. And then in Timothy, two times, it gives the, in the last days. I, I hadn't paid that much attention to it before. I hear people mention we're in the last days, which seems to indicate we're in close to the end of the countdown. And so I was kind of curious about in the last days. So I went and dug into it a little bit. And what I found is something that made so much sense. So I'll bring it to you this morning. What I found is that in the last days started when Jesus was born and will end when Jesus returns bodily from heaven. So we've been in the last days for 2,000 years. It's a, it's a time period. It's not a countdown as oftentimes people do, because they begin to read in Timothy, oh, people's loves growing cold and doctrines of demons and, and following the flesh. 
then we're in the last days and Jesus is going to return tomorrow. Well, wait a minute. Timothy read that and that was happening in his day, which was, you know, 20 years after Paul passed. So in the last days, we're in the last days for 2,000 years. It's a phrase of the time period that we are in and we have to see it as such. So it is possible that some of this passage was fulfilled in that moment, and some is yet to be fulfilled prior to the coming of Jesus returning again. Is that helpful? All right. So Jesus, I'm sorry, Peter's explanation of what is going on, he first of all says, he talks about Jesus when he's explaining the Holy Spirit. He goes back and he says, Jesus' ministry is validated. And he, he cites in verse uh, 22, in, uh, in verse uh, 22 through 24, validating Jesus' ministry. He said, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by signs, wonders, and by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. So Peter is very clear. You've seen signs, wonders, and miracles, and you know that they have happened through this man. It says, This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by... Tough word to see here. By nailing him to the cross. <laughs> that is a rough word. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it is impossible for death to keep its hold on him. That's a miracle in itself that the author of life died. <laughs> I mean, that's just, that's just amazing that you would even, how, how does that happen? But yet it did. It took place. And, and we see here, that, uh, that he died on the cross. You know, I just learned recently that we oftentimes, and I've taught that Jesus on the cross took 39 lashes from the Roman soldiers. I just learned recently that Jesus wasn't crucified under Jewish law that stopped at 39. He was crucified under Romans, Roman law that they, they, they gave as many lashes as they wanted to. So it was way more than 39. The idea that there's 39 diseases, 39 lashes, that's just kind of hearsay. They, they whipped him to the point where Scripture says he was unrecognizable. So it was way more than 39. Paul took 39 five times, but Jesus took way. We don't know how many lashes Jesus took. We just know that he was unrecognizable as a human being when they got done. It was way more than 39. And again, that was, this is all God's plan to be able to to uh, 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 settle the penalty of, of this human nature that uh, defied God so that it could be dead, so that we could receive new life. Amen. Then uh, Jesus' resurrection and exaltation is verified. And we pick up on verse 32 here, in, uh, and we see it says in verse 32 of Acts chapter 2, God raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of the Father, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. So again, Peter's explaining what's going on. He's poured out the promise of the Father. You see it and you hear it. That is happening. And he's verifying what is going on. And then finally, the need for the Holy Spirit given by Jesus. Let's just walk back into before Jesus uh, was crucified. What did he say about the Holy Spirit and why we needed him? And in John chapter 15, verses 26 and 27, he writes, and this is Jesus talking, When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth. I love that. The Holy Spirit is known as the Spirit of truth. Who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me, and you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. And so Jesus says, just as I have testified about my Father, then I'm calling you to be empowered witnesses to testify about what Jesus has done in your life. That's what he's saying. And you need, we need the Holy Spirit to do that. 
John 16, 7 through 8, uh, 16, 7 through 16. Jesus again says, Very truly I say to you, it is for your good that I'm going away. And unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment. About sin because people do not believe in me. About righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. About judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. There's a lot packed in there I'd love to get into, but we've got to keep rolling. Verse 12, Jesus continues, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. You ever been to a seminar or a place where it feels like you know, you're getting information like a fire hose? You're like, they're like... You're like, stop, turn it off, turn it down. That's what the disciples were at. They were saturated. And Jesus said, you're saturated right now. You can't even handle anything more. But I've got good news for you. After I leave and, and things kind of settle out a bit, I'm going to have the Holy Spirit come and teach you more. Like continuing education. He says the Holy Spirit's going to bring continuing education to you. That's great news. Instead of just being saturated and, uh, and, and then, uh, oh well, go on. All right, let's dive in or keep going. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take, the Spirit will receive from me what He will make known to you. So this continuing education happens through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. I want to jump back to John chapter 4, 14, 12 through 14. Again, let me just remind you, Jesus says that after I leave and the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to do greater works. Greater works. We're like, wow, what is that? That's what He said would happen. And again, we could go into that, but that's another time, another place. I want to kind of end this section here in Acts 1-8, where Jesus told his followers during that 40-day period, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So God wants his message to go out to the whole world through empowered witnesses of the church. Now, there's two Greek words that are oftentimes translated power in our Bible. If the translation is good, they'll actually give the definition rather than the word power. But they oftentimes they're both translated power, but they mean two different things. One is exousia, which means authority. And the other is dunamis, which means ability. All right? So when Jesus talked about the Great Commission to go into all the world, he said, all authority has been given to me. He accomplished everything. He said, all authority has been given to me. All right, so if all authority has been given to Jesus, then how much does the devil have? None. Zero. Zilch. Goose egg. That's it. None. But he still has ability. He still has ability on this earth to kill, steal, and destroy. So what are we going to do with that? He doesn't have authority, but he has ability. I don't know if you've ever had your house broken into and thieves come in and they steal things that are valuable to you. Did they have authority to come into your house? No. There was no sign on the door. You said, thieves, come in. You may have left the side door open or it may have been locked. They busted the door down. They did not have authority to come into your house, but the thieves came in and they robbed what was valuable and they took it out. What do you do? You get an authority that's higher than what you have to come and catch them. And that authority has the right to find that thief or thieves and to capture them and put them in prison. They have the ability to do it, not just the authority. So we look at this scripture, and what we find is that he says, you will receive power, you will receive the supernatural ability. You have the authority when you got born again. 
Jesus came to live inside of you. Now you are getting the supernatural ability to cancel any of the ability that the enemy has over your life to still kill and destroy. That's what you get when you get the powering of the Holy Spirit. You get an ability that supersedes the enemy's ability. You cancel his ability because you have been given authority from Jesus and then you walk in that supernatural ability to cancel out what he's trying to still kill and destroy in your life and others around you. Is that good news? That's like, wow, I want that, right? That's what's happening. That's what Jesus is communicating here, that we have supernatural ability to cancel what the enemy is trying to hand us. You see, what happened is that Adam handed that over when he was deceived. He and Eve were deceived by Satan. He handed that authority uh, over. He was originally given that to subdue the earth and to rule it, and he gave it up. Jesus took it back. Now I've got it back. And now I want to share with my sons and daughters that have faith in me. I want to share that authority. I want to share that supernatural ability. And you have it available to you. Because you can, you can be a person that has authority, but you don't think you have the ability. Come on now. How many defeated Christians have you met? Maybe you are one right now. You think, I, I, I guess I have the authority. I don't know. I certainly don't have the ability. I don't feel like it. No, that's just lies you're believing. He's, the, the, enemy is sti- the enemy cannot read your mind, but he can put thoughts that you think are from you or from that you believe. He can't read your mind, but he can put thoughts up there that you latch on to and think, oh, I guess that's true. Such as, well, I don't know if I have the authority or not. Or I don't know if I have the ability. I have the authority, but I don't know if I have any ability. Those are thoughts from the enemy that we have to recognize and say, no, wait a minute. I have all authority that I need to accomplish what God has called me to do, and I have supernatural ability to get it done. I was with someone this week, and they were, um, they were super stressed, in super fear, even lost their appetite because the circumstances that they were in weren't lining up or coming into the way that they thought they should. And as a result of that, they were distraught, lost their appetite, totally stressed. And I, I was like, I was, I was in it, and I didn't really discern it until after I left. I go, wow, what a horrible way to live. That you, that you live on the basis of circumstances being right, then you're having a good day. If circumstances are bad, then you're having a bad day. That's how you live. And many people live that way. The world lives that way. If circumstances are good, I'm having a good day today. If circumstances are bad, I'm having a bad day today. That's not an empowered witness, folks. An empowered witness is when the circumstances are are good, you rejoice and say, yay, God. When the circumstances are bad, you say, you better line up, you better line up, you better line up. That's how we're called to live when we're empowered by the Spirit. Do you live that way? Now you're quiet. You okay? All right. Yeah. And so Jesus took it back. He took the authority. He shares it with us. And he gives us the ability in being empowered by the Holy Spirit. Number three, the response to the Holy Spirit. Response to the Holy Spirit. In verse 37, it says, When the people heard this, They were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what must we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are afar off and for all whom the Lord our God will call. I want to key on this one phrase there. It says they were cut to the heart. What does that mean? It means there was a deep um, recognition or a deep conviction that something had to change. So what they did 
as a response to that being cut to the heart, they actually said, we want the goodness of God. We want to get right with God. We want, we want the fullness of what you're talking about. Now, the interesting fact is that five chapters later, in chapter 7 of Acts, you have Stephen giving a testimony in a history of Jesus to some not-so-nice people. But it uses that phrase there. It says, the Sanhedrin were cut to the heart. But what did they do? They didn't repent. They seized Stephen and stoned him. But it was the same conviction, but a different response. Same cut to the heart. Jesus, what must we do to be saved? Same cut to the heart. We're going to stone this guy and get him out of here. Because we hate the truth. So what do we learn from that? What I take away from that is that when God convicts you about something, if you don't do something about it in that moment or in that window of time, you'll actually end up getting offended at God and he'll take you further away because you didn't yield to him. But if you act on that conviction being cut to the heart and you say, God, forgive me, God, I want God, and then he will fill you to levels you never imagined. But if you reject that cut to the heart, then what will happen? You'll end up further away and you'll end up killing the very truth that was meant to save you. It's a very sobering moment. Cut to the heart. They said, what must we do to be saved? And so what we learn out of that is that when God speaks, we need to act. We need to act. Now let's just kind of uh, finish up here. And then the elder team is going to be available. We're going to lay hands on you, and I'll explain that a little bit, and, uh, and receive uh, the filling of uh, or first time or uh, of the Holy Spirit. That's uh, how we're going to end today. What did this crowd do? First of all, Acts 2.38a, they surrendered to Jesus as Lord. All right? Second, they received the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Acts 32.38b. Or Acts 2.38b. Then they identified as witnesses for Jesus. They became witnesses of Jesus. It says in verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They became empowered witnesses that day. And then finally, this was, became the expected pattern as I read <clears throat> earlier that you would be born again, water baptized, filled with the Spirit, and then you begin to mature in your life with Christ. That was the pattern over and over again as you walk down through the book of Acts. You'll notice that's what was taught. That's what was practiced. And as a result, you see the world around, wherever they went, whether it's in Jerusalem, whether it was in Samaria, whether it was in Ephesus, whether it was in Galatia, whether it was in Corinth, everywhere they went, Christianity rocked the world of all the religions around them because they followed this pattern and they walked in it. They recognized that they had shared authority from Jesus being born again. And they uh, received the power of the Holy Spirit, which gave them supernatural, miraculous ability to cancel whatever the enemy was throwing at them. And when he put them in jail, they rejoiced. They rejoiced. And they got out and they started preaching again. They were so convinced. Wow. Wow. What a sobering moment for us in the church in the West. As we come to a conclusion today, God wants his church full of empowered witnesses. He doesn't just want witnesses. He wants empowered witnesses. And I think it's important for us just to evaluate our lives. Do we feel empowered? When circumstances, whether they're our own or whether we walk into a circumstance that isn't God's will, do we normally think, oh, those poor people, I feel sorry for them? Or do we think, wait a minute, I think God can change that. Maybe I should go over and pray. Maybe I should say to them, maybe we should just gather together and see what God wants. Is that the way you think? Because that's what God's calling us to think like. 
Empowered witnesses. Yeah, those circumstances are terrible. They stink, but God can change them around. Is that how you think on a normal basis? Is that how you walk each day? Or do you walk each day, oh, that's pitiful. Oh, that's poor. Oh, that can't change. Oh, that's a hopeless situation. That'll never work out. See, we got to stop that, and we got to start thinking differently. And when you understand you have shared authority from Jesus... If, if we are thinking like hopeless situations can never turn, then we're more focused on the sin rather than being a son. And ladies, you can be a son too, positionally. See, it, we have to address our focus. Is it, is it on God or is it on the situation. Well, it might start with the situation, but where does it stay? God wants empowered witnesses, and he wants us to, to, uh, to rise up to that level in the body of Christ. Do you think that you have authority to defeat the enemy in your life, whatever the enemy is? We could go into many different ways. I don't know what the enemy is in your life. I have my own, you know, battles. But do you think this is going down. This is going, to, this is going to change in time. Do you stay at that place or do you just run or even not get started or not engage? Again, it's a question. God wants empowered witnesses and that's why he gave us Holy Spirit so that we could be empowered to take out the ability of the enemy that is barraging us every day. Do you stir yourself up in the Holy Spirit? Just like me, I wasn't feeling it this morning when I got up. And yet I didn't stay there. I knew what to do. Timothy was kind of lacking. Paul said, no, wait a minute. I laid my hands on you and there's something that came into you. Timothy, you stir that thing up. Don't back down, Timothy. I saw it happen. You have the gift. Now, do something with it. <laughs> well, the elder team is going to come up and join me, so you guys can come on up here and get situated. How we're going to do this is, first of all, the, the, uh, the opportunity. This is not a, a mandate. This is an opportunity. We're just doing elders. Uh, John, we're just doing elders at this point. Okay. So, um, uh, as, as we, um, this is just an opportunity that we want to give you to be empowered in a way that God desires you to be, be empowered. And so, for some of you, it may be the first time that someone has laid hands on you, which was a very repeatable way that they did in the New Testament. It wasn't the only way, but it was kind of the normal, repeatable way. Initially, it came with tongues of fire, but after that, it was the laying on of hands. That was, that was kind of a, the pattern that happened, and so we want to enter into that pattern this morning. We've done it different ways throughout the year. And then um, uh, maybe you said, well, I've been prayed for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but I just, I just I feel drained out. Well, now it's time to get stirred up. It's time to get stirred up again. And to understand that, it's that, that as, we, as you walk through in declaration, but as I'm ending today, I want to say something about speaking in tongues. You say, well, how do, how do you speak in tongues? Well, you just uh, ask the Lord to give you the language, and then you start. Just say something other than the language that you don't have, and you trust the Lord. It's a faith walk. You trust the Lord. And then as you, as you begin to speak in, in that language that God has given you, then you just use it more. You say, well, how do I know if, if it's just gibberish or if it's actual tongues? Well, if you, if you try to use a phrase over and over again, you'll get tired in about 30 seconds. You'll be done. If, you know, if you're trying to say, I see the key to my Honda, I see the key to my Honda, I should have bought, bought a Honda, but I bought a Kia. You know, if, you, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're in that phrase, you'll get tired uh, after 30 seconds or a minute, but when you get the language God has given you, you, you can pray in tongues for hours. Uh, I've, you know, I've prayed in tongues for an hour. And so 
You can also, your mind can function while you're praying in tongues. You can read the Bible. You can drive. You can um, probably not have a conversation with somebody. But, uh, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a whole different place of your brain. When you, when you use your normal language, it's up here. And when you speak in tongues, this part goes dormant. And there's, it's back in the back side of your brain that comes alive. They've actually scientifically documented that. And again, you dive into scriptures and you say, what's the benefit? What helped me get over the hurdle was that the Holy Spirit is a person and the Holy Spirit has a language. And since the Holy Spirit is a person, then it's a spiritual language. Simple as that. It's a spiritual language. All right, again, that's the way I started. I asked for, to speak in tongues on my bed. When I was in college, started very cumberly, cumbersome, and then just, again, through usage that it became fluid. So just as encouragement there, I thought I would share that. All right, declaration. Okay, here we go. Yeah. All right, again, join with me if you like. I declare today, I have been given exousia. Authority from Jesus, authority from Jesus. To, go into the world. to go into the world. And as I go, as I go he, is he is with me and will never leave me. Never leave. I, declare today, I declare today, I have received dunamis power, I received dunamis power. The, supernatural the supernatural ability to destroy the works of the devil, the of the devil. and establish the kingdom of God. The of Where I live, where I move and where I have my being. For the glory of God, amen.